Appreciate your help. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 11. The island of Haiti was hit by an earthquake in 2010, and the majority of the houses in Haiti were destroyed. That is not common. Usually some are destroyed, but in Haiti, the majority were destroyed. And the reason why, because of poverty, when uh, many Haitians are building their houses, sand is cheap. And so to save money, they used more sand than they should have in the, the cement. And then steel being expensive, often they left it out or didn't use enough steel. So they lowered the cost of what should have been there. That is, lowering the cost is what we call compromise. And because they compromised on the building, when the ground quaked, the houses absolutely crumbled. I use that as an illustration, preaching out of the text that we're going to look at, the men of a place called Jabesh Gilead in the Old Testament, the enemy is threatening them. They don't want to fight, so they try to lower the cost. They try to make a deal with the enemy, and this speaks of the dangers of compromise. I want to preach a message I've entitled, Making Deals with the Devil. We're going to skip through 1 Samuel 11. We'll start at verse 1, then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. All the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, make a covenant with us and we will serve you. Nahash the Ammonite answered them, on this condition I will make a covenant with you if I can put out your right eyes to bring reproach on all Israel. Verse 6 and 7, then the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard this news and his anger was greatly aroused. So he took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hands of messengers saying, whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen and the fear of the Lord fell on the people and they came out with one consent. Verse 11, so it was on the next day, Saul put the people in three companies they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch and killed Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it happened that those who survived were scattered, so no two of them were left together, making deals with the devil. Let's talk about deals with the devil. Our text is talking about people who want to make a deal with their enemy, and their enemy is called Nahash, Nahash the Ammonite. The name Nahash literally means shining serpent. And you know that the Old Testament, you have physical and literal events, but actually are spiritual or symbolic. Nahash, the shining serpent, is a picture of the devil, the enemy of our souls. These men, they were facing brutal warfare. This man, if he attacked them, he was going to brutally, not just kill them, he would torture and would do terrible things. But this is true for you and I. The enemy of our souls hates us. Listen, the devil wants to destroy you. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. 1 Peter 5.8 in the New Living Translation says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So these men, like us, are facing an enemy who is determined to destroy. Very simple thought in this text. The men of Jabesh didn't want to die. Unless you are strange, that's, that would be true for most of us. They didn't want to die. And they, but the problem is they were unwilling to fight. So your option when you have an enemy, you either fight them or you die. They didn't want to do either. So in our text, they propose to make a deal with the devil. 
what do we have to do to get you to leave us alone? How can we lower the cause? Verse 1, the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, make a covenant, a pact, a treaty with us, and we will serve you. This is what we call compromise. Compromise, compromise means an agreement by making concessions, or in other words, lowering the cost. God had told his people, you're going to face enemies in the land. Again, physical enemies back then, spiritual enemies for us. And God put it in plain terms. The enemies, there is only one option. You need to fight them. You need to kill them all or they will kill you. They will ultimately have an effect on you. Deuteronomy 7, 16. You shall destroy all the people whom the Lord delivers in over to you. Your eyes shall have no pity. You shall not serve their gods, for that would be a snare to you. So God had said very clearly, fight, or they are going to overcome you, or they're going to destroy you. But the men of Jabesh says, we don't want to fight. How can we make a deal so that we don't have to do what God told us to do. So why would you want to compromise? I think there are numbers of reasons. Unbelief. Many people simply don't believe what God says. God says, if you'll fight, I'll help you, you'll win. Deuteronomy 20 verse 4, for the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. But many people, they feel, I just can't do that. There are people that they come pray at an altar, but in their hearts they say, I just can't. I don't think I can live for God. I can't do right. Unbelief. And because they don't think they can, they want to make a deal. They want to lower the cost. Weariness. People get tired of the battle. The moment you give your life to Jesus Christ, you enter into a conflict. You're now on God's side in opposition to the powers of hell, and you are going to have to fight if you want to survive over time. Hebrews 12, 3. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Making a stand for Jesus isn't something you do one time. Deciding to do right morally or in integrity, that is not something you do one time and then you're done. You're going to have to do that again and again and again. And some people, the Bible in many different scriptures says they simply get tired. They get tired of doing what's right. They get tired of the problems that come sometimes from standing what's Right And weariness says, how can we just not fight so hard? Ataturk was the commander of the army in Turkey. During one intense battle in World War I, his men had been fighting and fighting and fighting. They were exhausted, but he knew that uh, uh, the enemy forces were going to be coming against them. And he warned them, if you fall asleep now, you will never wake up again. Weariness. So some people say, how can I make a deal so it's not so tiring? And then there's cost. I want to be honest with you. Serving God, there are wonderful benefits and blessings, but there is a cost. And if you're going to do right, there is a price to pay for obedience to God. There's a personal cost. If you serve God, that means... You no longer can serve yourself. You can't do everything that you want to do in life. Matthew 16, 24, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So that means then when we get saved, there are things that we intended and God says, no, I want something else for you. There are things that we feel are okay, and God says that's not okay. There's a personal cost to serving, serving God. There's a relational cost. When you choose to follow Jesus Christ, 
that naturally puts you in conflict with people. Matthew 10, 36, a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Some of you were shocked when you got saved. You thought your family would be so pleased that your life is changing, but in fact, your family got very upset. You're changing the family religion. You, you stop doing what they're doing. Mockery and persecution. When I got saved, I, I didn't pick quality friends. And when I told them that I was no longer going to party with them, I was going to live for Jesus Christ, they delighted in mocking. They would wait until uh, uh, everybody was around and they would begin to hallelujah, Mitchell. Praise the Lord. Mitchell's a Jesus freak now. And they like doing that. I, I, I didn't want anybody to mock me, but that's the cost. Sometimes people are not pleased. So for whatever reason, and there may be others, the temptation when faced with the cost is people want to compromise. They want to lower the cost. How can I do this cheaper? How can I belong to God, but it not cost so much. And so when people are compromising, they're not saying, you know what, I don't want to live for God, I want to be a Satanist. They're just saying, is there a way that I can still do what I want, that no one will be upset with me? I want to lower the cost. Let's talk secondly about losing your eye. It's interesting, they come to the devil and say, can we make a deal? And he says, absolutely. The devil is the ultimate used car salesman. Have I got a deal for you? <laughs> Nahash hates them. He is coming against them, not because they have a minor tiff, a little spat, a, a, a little disagreement. He wants to destroy them but the devil's a strategist. He knows that he doesn't have to kill them. Listen, if the devil wants to destroy you, he doesn't have to turn you into a drug dealer, a Satanist, a transvestite, in order to defeat you. All he has to do is get you to compromise. If he can get you to lower your commitment to God, it will have the same ultimate effect of destruction as open battle. In our text, it gives us a powerful lesson if you're ever tempted to compromise, and that is there is always a cost to compromise. Can we make a deal with the devil? And Nahash says, absolutely. On this condition, I will make a covenant. In other words, a peace treaty. I won't kill you, but this is what it'll cost you. I want to come and I want to poke out. I want to stab and remove all of your right eyes. And on that condition, then I will make a deal with it. Listen, you can't compromise with the devil. You make a deal with the devil, it's not free. It's not cheap. There is always a cost. Think about the cost of compromise. When you compromise, you lose the ability to defeat the enemy. He was very specific. He didn't say pick an eye, any eye. He said, I want your right eye. And the reason why the majority, I'm sorry, left-handed people, the majority of people in the world are right-handed. And so usually that meant if they're fighting, in those days, swords or spears, they would fight using their right hand. They often would go into battle holding a shield with their left hand, and they often would have it up here, and with their right eye, they're judging, and they're able to fight. One commentator says he who opposes his shield to the enemy with his left hand, he hides his left eye. He looks at his enemy with the right eye, he, therefore, who plucks out the right eye makes men useless in war. The devil says we can make a deal on this condition. 
I want to make you vulnerable. I want to make you unable to resist. Listen, once you make a deal, I don't know what the compromise is. Is the compromise in honesty? Is it in commitment? Is it morally? Whatever way the devil is tempting you to compromise, if you give in to compromise, you're not going to be able to defeat the enemy anymore. Once you compromise in honesty, you're not going to be able to resist peer pressure or lust. It's not going to happen. It's not like, okay, I'll let you put out my right eye, but that's it. Then I will never... No, no, no. You, once you start the process of compromise, you know, we... There's a, a, a word that is used in often in boats, in, uh, I guess they would use it in airplanes as well, but especially in boats or submarines, they say that the hull was compromised. You know what that means? There's an opening. There's a hole. Why did the boat sink? Because the hull was compromised. There's an opening. That is exactly what the devil is proposing here I'll make a deal with you, but then you are open. And once you are open, you cannot keep the devil out. Secondly, compromise causes a loss of vision. Verse 2, that I may put out all your right eyes. You know what happens to people who compromise? They compromise their integrity, their honesty, their commitment to God, their morals, whatever it is they become unable to see danger. It's amazing through the years I've seen and many years of salvation and pastoring, I see people who choose to compromise in their walk with God and then they lose spiritual vision. They miss obvious danger signs. They get into trouble and I'm often put like, how did you not see that coming? The Old Testament, Samson, he wants a woman, any woman will do. He chooses a Philistine woman who's a prostitute. And lo and behold, she arranges for him to be overpowered and they poke at his eyes. Samson, she was a hooker. What did you think was going to happen? How could you not see? She was a hooker who was of the enemy who hates your people. How did you think that was going to end? Butterflies and rose petals falling from the sky? That was a pretty easy thing to see. It wasn't going to end well, but compromised people is exactly the problem. They allow things in their heart, in their life, in their family that those who are not compromised thinking, that's insane. That's not, why would you do that? But they can't see it because they've lost their vision. You know, last year, the, the Titan submarine tragedy, a man built a submarine instead of out of steel, he built it out of carbon fiber because carbon fiber was a lot cheaper and it took less time. The owner of the company, he received many warnings. Experts in submarines, they wrote letters to him. The owner, the owner, Mr. Rush, they warned him, if you go into this ship that is carbon fiber, it is not strong enough to withstand water. It could end in, uh, uh, in disaster. They warned him about that for years. June 23rd, last year, 2023, the sub imploded, killing the owner and all five people on board. How could you not see that was coming? Once you compromise, you lose vision. Compromise causes you to become a reproach, verse 2, and bring reproach on all Israel. Reproach is shame, embarrassment. 
Nahash says, I don't just want to hurt you. I want everybody who sees you to be affected. I want everybody around you to be affected. You know what? By the way that you live, you affect other people's opinion, not just about you, but about God. A reproach on all of Israel. Israel were people that were supposed to be God's people. So Nahash says, I don't just want to shame you. I want to shame God. I want everyone to have a bad opinion. Have you ever had this happen? You ever witnessed somebody tell them about Jesus? They need to get saved and they say, I knew a guy. I used to work with a lady. And then they tell you what a lazy, dishonest, unrighteous person they were. So they're saying, no, I don't want anything to do with your God or the person while being lazy, immoral, dishonest, that I go to the potter's house. Like, There's no way I go there. That's not right. There, there are people that are living right, that do have integrity. Shame comes on them because of the way someone lives. That is exactly what the devil wants. If you compromise, you lose the ability to influence people who you love. The Bible tells about Lot. Lot compromised. Abraham said, pick wherever you want to live. We'll go in opposite directions so we won't fight. Lot chose the land near Sodom. There were unbelievably immoral and ungodly people there, but he could make more money. For money. He didn't ask God. He didn't ask Abraham, who was older in relationship with God, for money. And I've seen this again and again. There are people that sell their souls for a few more dollars an hour. For money. The day comes, two angels are sent. God is going to judge and burn up those two cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Get Lot out, and the angels warn him, you and your family, get out, because God is going to kill everyone in this city. And so Lot, the compromiser, goes and tells his family, Come on, we got to go. God is going to judge. And the Bible says to his sons-in-law, he seemed like one who mocked, or we would say in modern terminology, his words were a joke. What he said was absolutely true and correct. We are in danger. We need to move. But the problem is his compromising lifestyle to them. They said, what a joke. I've seen this through the years. Parents that for years have compromised and compromised and compromised. They won't do right. They lower the commitment. They do things they know are wrong. And then the kids start getting in trouble. And they go, honey, you need to live for Jesus absolutely true but to their children their words are a joke and you lose the ability Nahash means serpent I want to tell you the devil is a snake there is nobody you meet you say man that guy's a real snake that you're not complimenting them are you when you talk about someone who's a snake, they're deceitful. The, Bi the Bible says the devil is a liar, the father of lies. You make a deal with the devil, he will not leave you alone. It is not going to help you to lower the cost. This is what Europe is learning, isn't it? 
Europe for years has made deals with radical Islam. If we're nice to people who believe in radical Islamic theology, then they'll be nice to us. And they have let them build strongholds throughout Europe. But now they're learning, they're marching in the streets openly, saying death to you. We want to kill you. Like, we were nice to you. How come you're not nice to us? Because they're snakes, that's why. And the devil is a snake. Verse 4, the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul, told the news in the hearing of the people, and all the people lifted up their voices and wept. I want to tell you that if you make deals with the devil, you are going to be left crying. I was reading about a woman, Irit Lahav, a Jew living in Israel. She was a peace activist, you know, that they're surrounded by people who believe in radical Islam, who hate Israel, don't believe they have a right to exist. Irit Lahav was a peace activist. There, were, there was an element before October 7th of last year. They said, all this talk of having to fight and defend and build walls, and that's, that's just not nice. Why don't we just be nice to the Gazan people. She was in a kibbutz very close to Gaza. They invited Gazans to work on the kibbutz. They made friends with the Gaza, thinking this is what you do. If you just be nice to your enemy, your enemy will be nice to you because she said, I believed in the decency of the Palestinian people. Then October 7th, Ordinary Gazans, including some of the workers that they had befriended and paid money, they discovered the whole time that they were there, they were simply taking notes and targeting people, and they came and helped in the attack. One out of four of her neighbors were all killed, some of them brutally. And now Irit Lahav is shot. Now she is shocked. How could it be that these people could be so cruel? They try to make deals with the devil. Let's talk finally about saving yourself. God's will is that you have victory over the enemy. He doesn't want you to make deals with the devil because you don't have to. Because God loved these people, he provided someone who could help them, Saul the king, 1 Samuel 11 and 9. Thus shall you say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you shall have help. And the messengers came and reported it to the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. I want to tell you, we have a king who will fight for us. He will help. Psalm 18, 3, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. In the few short verses that we read, we learn how you can gain victory instead of compromising. Victory starts with an attitude. Verse 6, when Saul hears what he wants to poke out your eyes, his anger was greatly aroused. Saul was outraged. That is absolutely unacceptable. Listen, you need to get mad at the devil who's trying to offer you a lower cost. But ultimately, he just wants to destroy you, wants to destroy your testimony, your family. Nehemiah 13, 21, I warned them and said to them, why do you spend the night around the wall? If you do this again, I will lay hands on you. And he does not mean he's going to pray for them. From that time on, they came no more on the, on the Sabbath. You know what you need to do? Some of you here, you need to stop playing games with sin. You need to stop holding back from total commitment to God. Senator John Ashcroft once said in a speech, no reserves. We're called to live a life of total commitment. That's not only true as it relates to our faith, but also every aspect of our existence. God's word makes it clear that God abhors the tepid, and the middling, Revelations 3, 15, 16 says, I know your deeds, that you are lukewarm. 
so I am about to spew you out of my mouth. We must have no half measures, no reserves. Victory, secondly, requires faith. Verse 9, say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you shall have help. You need to believe God. You can do what God told you to do. And God will help you if you, if you do it. Here, here's the problem. When you stand for what is right, it doesn't pay off within the hour. This is the difficulty we have. What you need to do is make a stand with it. But my family is upset. Make a stand. Do what's right. But they're more upset. And what the devil says is, if you do right, your family will become drug dealers and they'll blame you. They will hate you. They'll burn in hell all because you decided to do what's right. That's not true. You've got to believe God. God, I am going to stand for what's right. I told you when I got saved, I told my friends, I didn't choose quality friends. I'm going to live for Jesus. They mocked, but I didn't back down. Don't care what you say. Don't care how you mock. I'm going to live for Jesus. Very interesting. Years later, Brother Dennis Rice was preaching in a, in a prison uh, near Globe, and a man came up and started talking to him. He was in prison, and he worked out what church he was from, and he said, do you know Greg Mitchell? And he said, yes, I know him. And he said, if you see Greg, tell Greg that he was right. Tell Greg he was right. That was a friend. That was the road I was headed on. Doing time for, for drugs. But God was able to touch. Over time, you've got to believe God. Victory requires taking action against the enemy. Verse 11, so it was on the next day. Saul put the people in three companies. They came in the midst of the camp in the morning watch. And they killed Ammonites until the heat of the day. You know what? Doing right is practical. The Bible is a practical book. For some of you, you need to not compromise. You need to do right. But doing right for some of you, that's not just like, let's all do right. No, it's very practical. For some of you, what does that mean? Some of you need to speak up. That's doing right. Some of you are secret disciples, aren't you? You're secret Christians. You work, you go to school with people, but they would never know that you're a Christian. You're compromising. So for you, it's similar. What does that mean? Speak up. Others of you, make a stand. You have people that are pressuring you to do wrong. Speak up and say, no. I will not do that. I refuse to participate, no matter what the pressure is. Listen, but everybody's doing it. You're going to get us all in trade. I don't care. I'm not going to participate and do what you do. For some of you, it's changing your relationships. I understood this when I got saved. I made a stand, my friends. They chose to reject the gospel. Very simple. I can no longer have the same relationship with you that I had before. It won't work. If I keep hanging with you, the Bible says evil company corrupts good morals, I would be the one in prison. Right along with my friends. Because that was the road that I was headed on. There are people here that you have people in your life, friends, family, people you used to go to church with, but now they are not a good influence. Now they're trying to pull you away from the things of God. They're speaking against your relationship with God. They're speaking against the church that got you saved and spiritually supports you. And some of you here, you're making deals with the devil. You go, but we've been friends forever. Then die today. I, I don't know. I just, I just don't want to be, I don't want to, I don't want them to think I'm mean. No, it's simple. If you're not going to do right, 
and you're going to hurt my walk with God, then apparently I need new friends. If you don't, you lose your eye. There's a reproach. Victory finally is possible because of a supernatural dimension. Verse 6, then the Spirit of God came upon Saul. When he heard this news, his anger was greatly aroused. It's interesting, how did the victory begin? It's an attitude, but the Spirit of God. I want to tell you, God gets involved. There's something empowering about doing what's right. There's, there's a struggle. I remember the struggle as I, I got saved during the Thanksgiving break. Going back to school, I'm, I'm dreading this. But I knew the only way I got to speak up. I went right out to my friends. I want to tell you, I got saved. I'm no longer going to part it. And when I did that, strength came in me. When you do right, because God's spirit will empower you when you refuse to compromise. I close with this story. The early... 1970s, the Iraqi government arrested a group of U.S. students on trumped-up espionage charges. Saddam Hussein wanted confessions, so the students were tortured in order to get them to confess to something that wasn't true. They weren't spies, they were students. But they lied to them and they said, if you will confess, you'll be set free. Pressure and pain continued. One by one, the prisoners, they started to confess to crimes they hadn't committed. Every student did that except one. You're torturing him, isolating him. They finally said, okay, today's the day. You either confess or you're going to die. Put a pistol up to his head, pulled back the hammer and cocked it. And they started a countdown. He had heard other people being executed from his cell. And they told him, if you'll just sign your name to this confession, you'll live. And he said, I will not. Closed his eyes and he thought he was going to die that day. They pulled the tr trigger, but the gun wasn't loaded. That prisoner was eventually released, and he discovered afterward every other prisoner who had confessed, they wind up hanging them in the public square. The only one who survived was the one who would not compromise. But I'm talking not just about your life. I'm talking about your soul. I'm talking about your destiny. I'm talking about your family. It depends on will you make a deal with the devil or not. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes all across this place. Thank God, with our heads bowed, if you're here this morning, I spoke about serving God. I'm honest with you, there is a cost for serving God. The cost of not serving God is greater. The Bible says that those who sin, they become slaves of sin. Their will is no longer their own. They have no power to break habits and mindsets and unhealthy ways of living. And then they face judgment eternally in hell. But it was never meant to be that way. God who loves you provides a way out. The king said, I can help you in that, the story that we read. And I'm telling you, King Jesus is the answer. God made a plan. We sang it in the song. He lived the life that we could never live and died the death that we should have died. He paid on the cross with his blood for your sin, for my sin, so we can go free. And if you are here this morning, God loves you so much. He wants to help you. And I am challenging you right now. What you need to do is make a decision for Jesus Christ. It won't happen automatically. It must be chosen. And I'm asking, how many people here 
you want to pray for God to forgive you, but by praying, you are saying, I want to leave my sin, I want to live for God. How many here, if that's what you want to do, I want you to do one thing, lift up your hand so I can see it. If you want to pray this morning and turn your life to Jesus Christ, hold your hand up so I can see it all across this place. I'm asking you to pray. Thank you. I see that hand over on the side. God bless you. Thank you. You can put your hand down. How many others? I need Jesus. I want to get right with God. Hold your hand up right now. I'm asking you to pray. I have nothing for you to buy. You don't have to enroll. I'm asking you to pray with a heart that wants to live for Jesus. Lift up your hand. Others, you need God. Some of you are backslidden. You were saved, but you turned your back on God. Backslider, lift up your hand. I want to come back. I want to get right with God. Lift your hand up right now. I need Jesus all across this place. I want to turn to God. I want to leave my sin. There's a battle going on. For some of you, the battle is the cost. You're thinking, what about my friend? What about my plan? Listen, it's worth it to serve God. It is not worth it to turn away from God. Anybody else? Quickly. Anybody else? You want to get right with God? Lift up your hand right now as God would deal with you. Thank God. This one that lifted his hand, look up at me. Amen. You meant that? Yes. You want to get right with God over here? Another one? Yes. Come here. I want to have someone pray with you. God bless you. Thank you for your honesty. You come to the front. I'm going to have someone pray with you. Just kneel down. God bless you, man. Need some men to come pray with them. Another man there. Quickly, you pray with them. I want everybody else to stand up. I'm going to open the altars. I'm inviting you. Some of you, the issues of compromise. The devil's been working on you. Maybe you already have, or maybe you're just feeling pressured. Come to the altar. Make up your mind. I am going to stand for God. I want what God wants for my life. They're going to sing while people are coming. He is exalted. He is exalted. He is exalted on high. Creation will praise Him. His saints will adore exalted he is exalted he is exalted he is exalted on high creation will praise him his saints will adore him for he Exalted on high. Sing it again, for he is exalted. He is exalted. He is exalted. He, he is exalted on high. Creation will praise him. His saints will. Exalted on 
And let's worship God right now. Father God, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you, Jesus, Lord God, for your goodness. You are able to help us, Lord God. Praise God. I want you to bow your heads. There are people that are here. Some of you are in the altar. That right at this moment in time, there are particular people who it is a battle. There's a struggle. There's family. There might be a friend. There might be someone they are pulling on you. They're speaking words. And when you get around them, you are swayed. You are tempted to turn away from what you know is right. And this is a battle. Some of you, it's affection. I've known them, whatever it might be. But you're struggling, and there's a particular person. It's like during the day, sometimes when you're in church, this person fills your mind, and there's a struggle going on. You need supernatural strength. How many of you, that's true for you? Lift up your hand. Amen. Amen. God knows that. God knows that. Amen. I want you to say this out loud. Say, Father God, I want to do your will, and I need supernatural strength. Forgive me of compromising. I choose to do what's right. I reject the words from hell that try to sway my mind. I will be freed. I break unholy connections in Jesus' name from this moment on. Amen. Let's pray for these people right now. God, I'm asking you're going to touch them. Bring strengthening in them right now. Enable them to choose what is right, Lord God. Enable them to stand for your will. I rebuke every word spoken of confusion, witchcraft, temptation, rebellion. Right now, it is broken off of their minds. They will be freed by the power of the Holy Spirit. You touch them now. Let's praise God together right now. God, I thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your power, Lord God. I'm grateful for your goodness. Praise God. Amen. We're going to be dismissed. I want to encourage you to come. We're going to pray one hour before the evening service in the prayer room in the other building. Uh, at 5.30, New Converts, a class for you at 5 p.m. in the main entrance foyer. But pray at 5.30, help us. And then our evening service, 6.30, Pastor Jesse is going to be preaching tonight and God's going to meet with us. Let's bow our heads. We're going to uh, be dismissed uh, in prayer. And I'm going to ask Matthew Halverson, you dismiss as we go. God bless you. Amen.